Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you're new to my podcast, it's Tall Tales with Taco. I am your host, Mitch Taco Bell. I am a retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel. I spent 29 years in the Corps total. I was able to do a tour over in Iraq and a long one in Afghanistan, then went back for a very short prison corrections deal in 2009, but I spent eight months with the Army. U.S. Army actually took great care of this Marine. I was one of maybe, I think, eight Marines that had IA billets with the Army, and originally, I believe we were with the 82nd Airborne at Camp Eggers, but uh, one of my mentors that I met over there was a senior Army uh, Colonel Chuck Busick. He's a West Point grad. He's done special ops work. He's a FAO. He has lots of really cool international experience, kind of man of mystery that you want to have these uh, incredible billets. Chuck was one of them, and we've been lasting friends forever. So if I have a layover up in D.C., go have dinner with my favorite colonel. But uh, tonight, um, I wrote a piece. The genesis of this was about uh, 2009. I came home from the prison corrections visit where we went, uh, took General Stone around to go see all the different prisons in Afghanistan and how we could get the fighters to quit being Taliban um, uh, IED diggers, things like that, and basically get these folks on board where we taught them how to read and write, gave them a vocation, whether a baker, a brick maker, or a rudimentary veterinarian. And then they would go back into the world and realize that the Quran did not say kill all Americans, jihad, jihad. So it was a kind of incredible experience to do that. But when I came home, I was, um, I don't know, maybe a little PTSD, but I was up at 3.30 in the morning and Sound of Music was on. And I was listening to How Do You Solve a Problem Like Maria, which made me think about Afghanistan. How do you solve a problem like Afghanistan? So I started writing out all of the things that had to do with the country, the religion, the politics, the uh, economy, justice, borders, I mean, you name it. And I just started putting facts of my experience down. And then I sent it to Colonel Busick. And I said, hey, uh, Chuck, could you do me a favor and, and read this and tell me what you think? And I'm actually going to read his deal when I bring him on. But uh, that in 2009 is as timely as it is today from all the way back to 2009. Everything I wrote is still the same. And without further ado, I'm going to bring my friend, Colonel Chuck Busick. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Taco. How are you tonight? I'm doing outstanding. I can't thank you enough for coming on Tall Tales with Taco. And um, we're going to have an interesting discussion tonight because I believe that there's it, this is important with the current world situation going on. We experience the behind the scenes of trying to teach them Western ways and, and what I figure is that most people hear about Afghanistan, th they know nothing, absolutely nothing. You know, like, why can't we have a ship just pull up there and the fighters go blow these guys up and stuff? Well, because it's landlocked. You've got Iran on one side, you've got Pakistan on the other side, and you can't get anything in there except to fly it or pay, you know, the millions and millions of dollars we paid the thieves up in Pakistan to let us through the uh, pass, Kyber Pass, right? So this, I wanted to do tonight a big picture deal. And we could kind of go through and talk about all the different aspects of Afghanistan, starting starting with, actually, I just want to read uh, your piece, the last thing that you wrote. And I'm going to start... Um, you be basically a very well written couple of comments. I believe the average Afghan makes twenty dollars a month, not two hundred. You are correct. You don't fix Afghanistan be because through the eyes of the Afghans, it's not broken. That's absolutely right. It's broken only through the eyes of the Westerners and most particularly of the European Westerners. If we want Afghanistan to be more like the West, there's an argument that it is broken. The Afghans must be thanking their God for the good fortune that not one but two superpowers have invaded them, enabling them to financially shake down both, just as your example of the police checkpoints on the Ring Road. Can Providence strike three times with the invasion of China someday? Who is to say <laughs> if wiping your ass with your hand and washing with water is any less effective than using toilet paper when both techniques get the job done? 
true. Corruption is a way of life. One-handed corruption puts food on the table, while two-handed corruption makes you rich. Justice is based on the Islamic belief of honor and loyalty, not right or wrong. In spite of cultural differences, wasn't originally Al-Qaeda the biggest issue? And how did we, the U.S., lose focus? How did we develop a logic path that said Taliban, by allying yourselves to Al-Qaeda, made them terrorists, when in fact they were just insurgents? Anyone uh, know of any reports of the Taliban planning to attack the U.S. once they are restored to political power in Afghanistan? You wrote this in 2009. If we are fighting the global war on terrorism, perhaps we should fight terrorists, not insurgents. If the terrorists have moved from Afghanistan, the basic tenets of the art of military warfare would suggest we move on to either press the fight on or conclude the fight over. Protecting America from terrorism, is my opinion, has nothing to do with bringing Afghanistan to the new 15th century or 21st century. Destroying the village in order to save it has been issues, but only because it's just become more ludicrous uh, while at the same time you're building nation capacity. Very respectfully, the colonel has been there. Well, I got to tell you, sir, that that is an incredible um, piece that you wrote that actually, that still stands true today. So when we talk about it, Afghanistan, you know, I wrote the calendar. I had to look it up. The calendar right now, the Harar calendar, or how do you pronounce it? Hera? Hera. Um, they're in 1400. That's 1400 from when uh, Muhammad made the, the passes, the trek from uh, Mecca to Medina. That's 1400. That's still 100 years from Columbus discovering America in technology wise. And they're still there, you know. How do you how do you fix that? You don't, right? right? But damn if we didn't try. So talk about what did you do at C Sticka when we were at Camp Beggars? Your job well, exactly. Well, Taco, I think it's important for the audience to understand what our relationship was, and it has to do with how I got there to begin with. You know, um, I was in the Pentagon and uh, the the uh, sec the chief of staff of the army had just been f relieved by Rumsfeld, and so they brought in General Schumacher, and he got us all together one afternoon and the colonels and the generals, and he said, "Hey, look, gentlemen, I see a lot of very proud combat patches on those left sleeves, but a lot of them are dusty. I need you all to help me out. I need to go back to Iraq or Afghanistan. We're going to have a new policy. It's going to be called." TCS or temporary change of station. Your family will stay where you are, but you will go over there for a year. You will leave your desk in the Pentagon. You'll leave it empty. Your boss won't like that. And then you'll come back. So I was asked because of my background as a special operator and the work I'd done in Colombia to go to Afghanistan. And I was supposed to go and be the senior mentor to General Karimi, who was the vice chief of staff of the Afghan army. But when I got there at C. Sticka, my West Point classmate, Andy Toomey, who was a one star, and Bob Cohn, who was, the, who was two years younger than me, class of 79, was the two star. And the interesting thing was Bob and I had played football together at West Point. Unfortunately, we'd never beat Navy in those days. Uh -huh. We beat them pretty well now. And, um, and Andy was there, and they said, Chuck, we brought you in under orders to be the vice or to be the senior mentor to the vice chief of staff of the Army. You can do that standing on your head. We need an international guy. And I go, what do you mean by that? They go, well, you are a fail. And you speak foreign languages. You know, you speak Italian, you speak German, you speak Spanish. I says, well, that's true, Andy, but I don't speak Urdu or Pashtu. Right. <laughs> and they said, and Andy says, Chuck, you know language. It's just about the words. <laughs> As if that's all of them were So my role was to ostensibly work with our NATO and European Union allies to help shape conditions so the U.S. military could accomplish what they wanted to do. Because prior to my arrival, the U.S. Army would go out and spend $2 million preparing some program or putting something together, and someone from the United Nations would go to President Karzai and say, we don't like what the Americans did. And now he'd go to Bob Cohn and say, please stop doing what you're doing. And Bob would say, you know, had I known ahead of time, I wouldn't have done that. I'd have done something different. So that was my role. So back to the relationship part, 
I'm supposed to travel all over Europe. And one afternoon, a gentleman came up to me out of the State Department, and he was he'd been he'd gone through ROTC and been a lieutenant in the army and been a military police officer and gotten out. And then he'd gone back to Florida and he was now the police chief in Key Largo. But he was on a two-year temporary assignment to the State Department in an organization called the International Law Enforcement Agency. I know. I know. And he said, hey, look, I have this airplane and I can get you all over Afghanistan, but I don't know where to go and what to do. I'll give you my plane if you'll take me along. And because he had body armor and because he had a weapon and he was a police officer, I felt fairly safe that if we got in a firefight, we could go do that. Well, so I, I explained this to General Cohn that I was going to be traveling. And he says, you know, Chuck, I'm a little concerned. He says, the Taliban want to capture a colonel or a general and they want to take their head just like they're doing down in Iraq. Right. So somebody called somebody over in this the, over at the embassy. And the next thing I know, young uh, Lieutenant Colonel Taco Bell shows up and says, hi, I'm your bodyguard. I'm supposed to go with you. And we hit it off immediately. So he had the long gun. I had the short gun. And uh, what I preferred to carry in those days, of course, was not a pistol, but the call sign for the JTAC to call in a B-2 bomber. You know, that was my preferred weapon. But Taco was there in case we got into the close fight. So that was the relationship we developed. Well, that was yeah, Go ahead. The, long, the long gun. So they were calling me um, Thomas. Um, oh, shoot. Never mind. Okay. Because I had I had the long gun, and they were always giving me um, giving me hell about that. You guys had the high speed until the FBI gave me an M4. Never mind. Right. Go ahead. Well, and what was interesting, and I think this is important, you know, when I got to Af when I got there to to Kabul, Bob Cohn said, "Chuck, you've studied military warfare and the art of military uh, history, and you understand." He says, "We need to think of ourselves as the Pacific theater, and Iraq is Europe." Until we solve things in Iraq, we're supposed to hold on to what we got. And the officers in my group, the other colonels, we couldn't get access to an M16 or an M4 because there weren't any. They were all down in Iraq. So when, when Taco came over with a pistol and a rifle, I thought, hey, this is pretty good. But our role was I had a $3 billion trust fund. Not a personal one, unfortunately, but it was owned by the U.S. government. And my job was to manage that. And that $3 billion was to help train the police. Well, stop. Before that, everybody yeah. ought to know that when we, after we did the invasion, right? So as a co coalition of allies, everybody had their little slice of pies. Yeah. So the Italians had, they were in charge of the justice system. The Italianos had to do with the justice. The... Um, French were up in the northeast. I don't know what the hell they were tasked with. The Germans were tasked with training the police up in Conduce. Right. And they failed. They failed miserably. And right. so then it was it became incumbent upon the United States Army to not only train the Afghan National uh, Army, the Afghan National Police, the rank and reform. I mean, everything fell onto the Army, which fell into that command of c a Combined Security Transition right. Command. Even... I still have this, the air power guys. So yeah. the Air Force guys that were teaching the uh, Afghans how to fly fixed wing or helicopters and whatnot. Right. So so everyone understands that originally each country had their own portion, um, which was amazing to me because nobody paid their bills. And forget the Europeans. You remember Interpol? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Upol or whatever they, yeah. <clears throat> they called themselves. Those guys, you would call up and you're like, hey, I need to speak to um, uh, Franco. Oh, he's he's gone back to Belgium. <laughs> what? Yeah, he's on vacation. Yeah, every, every, like, every, every two weeks those guys were going on vacation or something. And it was – that was miserable. So, all right, so Sistica takes over the entire command of fixing the country. That's right. And so as Biden says, President, President Biden says – no, Kabul will never fall. There's 300,000 trained, highly trained. Yeah, until we took our our uh, airplanes out of there to give them some air support. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So, so back to the story. So my role was to work with our European allies, with the European Union, the European Commission, and NATO. And believe it or not, those three separate entities that are all in Brussels sometimes acted as if they didn't know each other and they're in the same city. Right. And they, there was always the inner fighting and the Europeans were concerned that they were going to miss out. They'd missed out on so many other opportunities that the United States had gotten themselves into. They thought this time, this is going to be, you know, an opportunity and it's going to be rich and we're going to further, you know, our foreign policy and we're going to go on. So we were working that piece of it to try to, you know, coordinate both with them and with the, um, you know, the Afghans. So the year before Taco and I had arrived in, in Afghanistan, the, our predecessors at Sistica had written a letter to Spain, to the Guardia Civil. They'd written a letter to, the, to France, to the uh, Gendarmerie, and they'd written a letter to the Carabinieri, asking those three organizations to send trainers over to Afghanistan to train a special police force, which we called ANCOP, which would have been like the Gendarmerie, the Guardia Civil, or the Carabinieri. And believe it or not, the Carabinieri a year later said they'd come and do it. What was interesting is 4,500 Carabinieri are deployable at any one time around the world, and they do a lot of this. And they had been in Iraq and done some work down there, and so, so they said, yeah, they would come. So one afternoon, Bob Cohn calls me up and says, hey, Chuck, coming up to the office and I go, yes, sir. And he says, did you bring your U.S. passport? And I says, yes, sir. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go get on an airplane. I want you to go to Rome. I want you to negotiate the U.S. government agreement with the government of Italy. But Carabinieri support. You give them what they want. He goes, I have money, but I don't have people. So let's make this happen. And the last thing he said as I walked out the door is he goes, Colonel, you better come back. <laughs> I remember when you took <laughs> off. What a great trip. You loved yeah, him. because... As Taco can tell you, Afghanistan for a soldier or a Marine or a sailor or an airman was probably the best job they'd ever had in the worst place they'd ever been. Yeah. Because we truly got to do what we were, we were, we were all trained to do. So we coordinated for the Carabinieri. They come back to Afghanistan with us. We get them all set and organized. And Taco and I get on an airplane and we fly out to Herat. Wait, before you do that, there you are. There we are. Yep. And yep. that's the Italiani. And yeah. then here they are all geared up, and ready to roll, ready to roll. You know, it was an interesting thing, Taco, because when they were when they were staying at Camp Eggers in, in Kabul, you know, they wore their their blue little outfits, which is just kind of a light jacket yeah, that that there. And it doesn't look that terribly impressive, you know, and um some of my fellow colonels were giving me a hard time about, look at these Carabinieri, what kind of war fighters are they? Are you sure they're safe? On the morning we left to go out to Herat, they stepped out of their rooms and they were wearing beautiful desert camouflage clothing, coordinated camouflage body armor. Uh -huh. and each one of them had four grenades on their body <laughs> armor. They had extra magazines on their body armor. They all had a pistol, a knife, and a rifle in their hand. And one of the fellow colonels looks at me and he goes, they're police? I says, very special police. Right. Yeah. right. Well, explain why, when they were out in, um, in Herat, ANCOP, because of the Afghan National Police, you couldn't take somebody from the north, a tribal person from the north, and make them a cop down south. And right. what we needed was we needed uh, policemen who weren't corrupt that would fall into the corruption scheme. Yeah. And you couldn't place guys in different parts. I mean, it'd be like taking somebody from Alabama, putting them up in New York right. and or vice versa. Um, we needed a centralized, almost like FBI or, um, you know, some sort of centralized police that could go around. That right. was the, that was the reason we had formed that. And those guys were right there looking at Iran um, out there in Herat. Right. Iran was just right there training training the things i've got some pictures of the uh the guys this was a classroom shot right because when we were out there they were giving us a tour of the classrooms and they had guys out there doing riot protection stuff yeah. um and of course 
you go fly out there and remember that piece of crap russian i don't even know what the hell they called that thing but yeah. it rattled and shake like a, a washing machine i thought we we're gonna die that was a bad time to be a pilot and to realize you know <laughs> i don't know if i really want to fly that thing but flying out to harat loud, right. that was miserable now this was our also our other mode right and we had those Russian pilots. They're Ukrainian contract guys that flew us yeah. around. Boris Doris and Chuck Norris. And Boris could speak <laughs> English. And I remember I remember being out in um, in Herat, out in the middle of the country there, where if anybody's ever been to Herat, they have the the beautiful um, um, Buddha statues that were that were torn down, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. But uh, we're sitting out there, and he's pumping gas next into the helicopter and, and Doris is sitting there with a hand pump and he's smoking a cigarette right next to it. And I go, you know, Hey Boris in, in the Marines, we can't smoke within a hundred feet of the flight line. Don't worry. You Americans, you'll do way too uptight. This shit will not blow up. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to go over there by the tree and I'll wait. You just give me a, a circle when we're ready to roll. Right. Yeah, don't worry. Taco pussy. <laughs> like, yeah. I never liked two Americans much. Why is that? Uh, because when I was here, they would uh, be fly along. You give stinger missiles to these uh, hajis. And I tell you what, man, you fly. And I look to my left. There's wingman. I look to my right wingman. I look back to my left. He's gone. Fireball gone. Yeah. You know, you uh, never liked you Americans. Well, look, man, I was in junior high when that happened. <laughs> I know. I know. But uh, I'm just telling you, I like you now because you pay my bills. It's okay. <laughs> there you the go. I'm like, no, I'm fine. Your, your cigarettes aren't very good for me. But uh, yeah, so it was an interesting combination of international and um, uh, a lot of a lot of goodwill at first. I thought, mm -hmm. but now overlooking the country, we talk about rank and reform. The Afghani's large number. What would you say? illiterate how many 90 percent of the country 97 percent are illiterate and that is such a hard number to grasp that only three percent of the country can read and surprisingly that three percent of the country many of them have been educated in london and in boston and at stanford you know so the three percent that can read are the educated wealthy ones and the, everybody else the 97 are your you know, you either have very rich or very poor. There's no in between. Right. And there were some leaders that were great leaders yeah. in the field. They just couldn't read. So when right. rank and reform came out, we made all the Afghans, uh, high rank uh, Afghans, generals and colonels, take a uh, test. And they couldn't, if they couldn't pass right. the basic test, then we put them in classes. Well, some of them got demoted, which was um, losing face. And so we lost those guys. But that was a, a very difficult deal. It's, and like I said, they're not stupid by any no. means. They're very shrewd. Yeah. But um, they, they weren't teachable. No, no. And and it, you know, General Cohn asked me. He said, Chuck, you're my you're my culture guy. You're my foreign area officer and my warfighter. What do you think? And I said, Look, I said we are not going to be successful here because of culture. And of course, even a general officer doesn't want to hear that. And he says, are you talking religion? I said, culture is part of religion. But I said, look, I said, the, their way of thought is so different from our way of thought that even on a normal business concept, military concept, humanitarian concept, it just, not, just may not make sense. Let me give you an example. There was a, in, a, in a small village where we'd put the police um, one gentleman, one Afghan gentleman went over and stole the other Afghan gentleman's prize goat. And I have to tell you, the goat and the sheeps in Afghanistan are very prized because they provide wool, they provide milk, and they provide meat. So anybody that's got a, you know, a good prize, you know, goat wants to keep him. Mm -hmm. Well, the, there aren't that many sheep that you kind of don't know who the, you know, the, the prize sheep are. So the guy steals his buddy's sheep and the police have to go over and resolve it. And I had to go, I had to go out and see how they were doing this. And here was the deal. You know, Matula says to Azim, Azim, that's my goat. You know that. And the police officer says, yes, that's, that's his goat. And he says, okay, what are we going to do? Arrest him. He says, no, no, no. We resolve this. Either give him the goat back. No harm, no foul. Pay 
money for the goat, no harm, no foul. Or giving one of your daughters, no harm, no foul. In Afghanistan, they resolve things. They're more concerned about loyalty and honor than they are about right and wrong. You know, it's just a different concept. We're there saying, geez, he broke the law. And they're going, what's the law? You know, we don't understand what that means. So that was a significant cultural difference between us and them that was hard to overcome. Well, the justice system over there, if I was a a bad guy, say, I mean, like a really, really bad guy, Al Qaeda guy, and you caught me in a raid. And so I'm an HVT. I got caught in a raid. The Afghans got me. So they send me to the justice system. I go before court. In between me getting sentenced to jail, my Al-Qaeda buddies could find a substitute, pay the family of this Muhammad Muhammad to come take my place in jail, and then I go free. I mean, how do you... How do you equate that to justice? And their idea is, well, somebody's butt's in jail, so win-win, right? Right. And they it's just- Korea law. You know, an interesting thing that years later, as I was thinking through, at the end of World War II, uh, when we were in Germany and we had all these German prisoners of war, and we we're trying to sort out what to do with them, whether to release them back into the economy or ship them to the United States or Canada, whatever. we went through the ranks and asked American chaplains if they spoke German. And if they did, they'd say, okay, you go do Lutheran services, you go, you go do Presbyterian services, you go do Methodist services, you go do Catholic services. We were able to do that in Germany. We were not able to do that in Korea. We were not able to do that in Vietnam. And we were not able to do it in Iraq and Afghanistan because it's not just about language and it's not just about religious views. It's about cultural views. American Muslim pa- uh, chaplains in the U.S. Army were not accepted in Iraq. Right. You know, I talked with a bunch of them. They said, look, they go, you're not Muslim, you're American. I go, no, no, I'm Muslim and American. And so those are the kind of cultural things I think sometimes people misunderstood because they wanted to talk. Well, you're talking religion or you're talking culture. And I go, I'm talking at all. It's right. just they're a different they're a different you know, they're culturally think differently than we do. You know, I met I met a young kid, this kid right here. You look at that kid's face, right? He spoke English, French, German, Russian, Pashtun, and Dari. Right. That kid right there. I met him. He's a, a, a street urchin. And he would go spend, I think, uh, three hours in the school that the um, uh, embassy set up. Right. And so... So that young kid, I tried, I went to the embassy and actually put in for adoption to try to adopt this kid, had no parents, called Teresa and said, hey, honey, what do you think about this? I've really prayed on this. What do you think about adopting this kid? He is brilliant, smart, just outgoing. And you could imagine the opportunities we could give mm-hmm. this boy. And she says, go for it. If, if you want this, go for it. So I go to the, you know, into the embassy and talk to the State Department guys. And they put me up with um, one of the, the big guys. And he's like, not only no, but hell no. What right. do you mean? I'm offering a chance for this kid to come to the States. And he said, no, no, no Muslim kid can go back with an infidel, with a non-Muslim. And uh, just can't do it. Yeah. And it broke my heart. You know, and now that kid, he was, I think he was about nine years old in, when that photograph was taken in 2009. So you know, he could be one of those kids that was unfortunately hanging on the gear of the C-17 yeah. trying to get out of Dodge. Yeah. Um, smart kid, just brilliant. But because of the culture, because of the religion, you can't do that. So right. how do they actually know what's going on over there? They know mean? because the people. They can't read, right? There's no right. newspaper. So they have religious broadcast. They have radios, battery-operated uh, wind-up radios. I right. would see those all all the time and they're broadcasting whatever the imams are telling them so the only news that they have and know is what the imams tell them right and when general um uh, stone we went back and we toured all the prisons we sat behind an observation glass and he's in there with his interpreter talking to this guy a real bad guy and he said why don't why did you why do you attack americans and he says because 
The Quran says, kill all Americans. Yeah. Kill all Americans. And he goes, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. And he pulls a Quran out in, in Dari and he says, look, I'll tell you what, if you can show me where it says that, I'll let you free. No, this is a trick. No, I'm serious. You take reading lessons. I'll teach you how to read if you go to these classes. And then I'll slide the Quran and I'll, I, because I, he can read fluent Arabic. So he goes, I, I'll slide a Quran across and I'll pick out a passage. If you can read that passage, I'll let you free. And he would. He would uh, give those guys a vocation and they'd leave. And all of a sudden it was like, you know, the when you're able to read and you realize that they've been lying to you, um, then things change, right? So that was, I saw that as Mark steps for the better for the country. Right. But that just didn't. That's just I, I'm getting so much off my chest right now. I've been bottled up for 13 yeah. years thinking about this and how much it pisses me off and how much money we wasted yeah. and the hubris that we had thinking that we could go in there and be the big gorilla on the block and build a 700 million dollar embassy that is now what sitting still. I mean, I'm sitting here playing with my coin. That's probably worth yeah. eight hundred dollars on uh, right. eBay now because. I guarantee you, nobody else is getting a coin from the Marines at the embassy there. But yeah. um, we built that big embassy. You remember that? And Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we had all the State Department people and all the NGOs. And somebody asked a question about well, how is there 10,000 Americans in Kabul? I don't think there were, I don't get 10,000 now. I could see a thousand NGO organizations, you know, a thousand is scattered around yeah. that were doing NGO work. I don't see 10,000 over there unless there were Afghans that became citizens. I don't know. Sure. Well, you know, back to that, that discussion about reading and, and culture. So I went to his, his shop in downtown Kabul off of Chicken Street, and he was called the bookseller of Kabul. And he owned a antiquities bookshop in Kabul and in Islamabad. Now, you know, when Duran drew that line north and south down the middle of the map back in I forget what it was, 1908 or whatever, divided the tribe, the Pashtun tribe. He said, see, we'll create two countries and just separate the tribe. But the Afghans don't think of it that way. They don't know that there's a border when they get to the, you know, when they get to the, the, uh, uh, the Pakistani border. They think, no, no, that's still my country. But anyway, this gentleman had two stores and he had antique books in both. And of course, when the Taliban invaded, he took most of his books out of the store and sent him over to Islamabad to be safe. But he kept a few. And one afternoon, when the, the Taliban had fully overwhelmed Kabul, they came into his bookstore and they decided to burn the books, which seems to be a universal theme anytime <laughs> bad guys <laughs> want to do this stuff, right? Let's burn the books. So they're going to go burn the books, and he grabs the Koran and holds on to it. And he's protecting it with his chest and his body, and they're beating on him, and he's telling them, in Dari, this is the Quran. This is our holy book. And finally, they stopped beating on him and said, look, the five of us don't read. We don't know how to read, so we can't. So we're going to go get somebody who can. And when we come back and find out this is not the Quran, not only are we going to kill you, we're going to kill everybody in your family. And that's the yeah. way they were. Now, one of the issues is the Quran is in, is in Arabic. Right. And it is a sin under Islamic faith to translate it from Arabic into any other language. That's right. I was wrong. It was Arabic that he had yeah. done that, not Dari. That's right. And so okay. these Afghans who don't, you know, they speak three different dialects, Pashto, Dari, and Tajik, those three languages aren't Arabic. So they couldn't read the Quran anyway, but they can't read, so they also can't read. So these guys go off and they bring a guy back who could speak Arabic and could read the Quran. And he looked at the Quran and he read it and he hands the Quran back to the bookseller and says, you stay in the store. And he walks out to talk to his five guys. And the bookseller says, all I heard was five shots. The guy shot his five best soldiers. That's what you have to get your head around to understand the culture of Afghanistan. You know, <sighs> scary. And, th and then you look at the Hazara, so you have the Zara right. who are the descendants of Genghis Khan. So they're right. they're more of a, I think I have a, a picture of some young young kids that I met that were Hazara and um, 
and they, I don't know if that, no, those kids were just Afghan. Um, right. So they have Chinese features. Yes. But they were discriminated against massively um, because, because of their features. And so the Taliban would take them, you remember that big pool the Russians built up on the side of the mountain? Uh-huh. That, that was their execution pool. So they, yeah. put the, they put the gays up there. Anyone that they, <laughs> that, that's a whole nother subject. Right. Um, they put the gays up there and walked them off the high dive into an empty swimming pool. Yeah. Uh, in that Russian pool. And they took the Hazara and they did the same thing. And then the, um, uh, the folks out in Bamiyan, but they were mainly Hazara, if I remember right. They were all, that was all Hazara out there. Yeah, yeah. that was all Hazara in the middle of the country. So the Taliban right. would avoid that area because if they crossed through there, the Kiwis were out there and yep. they would, they would notify the Kiwis. Well, all right. So that goes back to another story. You want culture. You want to talk about how messed up it is over there. I got a phone call from my connection, my Kiwi connection out in Bamiyan. And he says, Taco, can you help me? What, what, what's going on? He goes, I have a young 14 year old girl whose uncle uh, or cousin got out of prison and he comes to their house and he tells my dad, you know, the girl's dad, I want to marry your daughter. And he goes, okay, you've been in prison a long time. Okay. So he yeah. takes his daughter and gives it to this guy and they go to the I mom and the I mom marries him. He drags her back to her house or his house, his sister's house or something, rapes her, beats her. She escapes. She has this boy that she likes. She goes to the boy. They go to the friends. They tell the parents what's going on. They end up going to an imam who says, you didn't have any witnesses, so that's not a legal wedding. So he marries her in front of, marries the boy and the girl in front of her friends and the parents. So now it's a legal wedding. So now they go down to the police station to report her dad and the cousin for, for this sham marriage that they put him in. Right polygamy or whatever and the uh, the police officer arrests her for polygamy right and puts her in jail then they arrest the dad and the cousin for doing the arranged marriage but the girl doesn't go to a girl's prison no she is in general population with all these men and there's no protections for her so I got a hold of uh, I can't Steve I can't remember the guy's name he was like the head lawyer guy that was advising the chief justice for the right. Afghan uh, Supreme Court. We put the package together, gave it to the guy, and got her released. Yay! Right? Win, win yeah. for the uh, for the good guys. Uh. Uh-uh. The judge also released the father and the cousin. So then, all of a sudden, this girl and her boy have to go like five villages away, right. and they're they were in hiding. Hell, she's probably right. stoned to death by now. Um, so you got that stuff going on, and you're like, how can they allow that? But well, it again. goes, yeah, Taco goes back to culture. You know, I got called one day by the, so General Cone calls you up and says, hey, Chuck, I can't make this meeting, but the Minister of Interior who owned the police would like me to come by and witness what's about to happen. The minister is going to demote two police officers because of a situation they didn't handle and we need to fix it. So he says, you go over there and see it. So I get over there and I meet with the minister and I got General, you know, Mangal is there that ran the police and and the minister and everything. And what had happened was a Mahujuddin fighter that had lost his leg fighting against the Russians was now an older gentleman and he was on crutches. And somehow he had, he had insulted another gentleman in the village. So this is all, this goes back to honor, Mm. right? And so the gentleman that was insulted comes to the guy's house. And in Afghanistan, you know, they don't have doors. They just have the little beads or, or they have a blanket. You can't really kick a guy's door in. You just push the blanket away and go in. And he goes in and he beats up the Mahujuddin fighter who only has one leg and ties him up and puts him in the corner. And then he proceeds to rape the Mahujuddin fighter's wife and daughter in front of him because that goes back to honor. Okay, right. he wants to get his honor back, and then he leaves. Well, so that the wife and the daughter recover, and they get their the husband and father untied, and they go to the local police. And when they get to the local police, um, they explain what happened, and the police are going to handle it because we've trained them about rule of law. So the police go and they arrest 
the guy that, that beat up the Bahut Jadeen fighter and raped the, the woman and the daughter and put him in, in temporarily in jail. But then the police chief sent two police officers back to the house to beat the wife and the daughter for bringing shame on the house. Right. So the victims are victimized. And, you know, that was one of those cultural differences that was so very difficult difficult for us to understand. We're talking about right and wrong. They're talking about honor and loyalty. You dishonored me. Therefore, you got you you got raped, which brought dishonor on my family. Therefore, I have to punish you. And unfortunately, yeah. that's a difficult thing for us to understand. How many people out there have read The Kite Runner? That was a required reading before we came over. Yeah. And as I'm reading it, I'm like, well, this book's okay, you know. And then I get to the part where he lets his best friend get raped in the alley. And I'm just like, this is bizarre. Yeah. And then when you start to understand the whole, you know, we used to joke about Man Love Thursday. When you understand the whole culture of um, a women, a women cannot, you can't do, like we had to have female Marines to speak to a girl in a burqa. Right. Um, I mean, I've got, I've got a picture somewhere of me standing. I'm standing right next to a blue orb and I am not allowed to say anything to that woman. Right. You know, I just have to act like a statue. I can't say anything. And, um, so, so women can't get married till they're about 25. You know, they, they don't get, they are not having premarital sex. So then you have these guys going out looking for the young boys. And then it just kind of is ancestral type thing. It just, you know, that kid grows up to be 16, 17 years old. He finds a young boy. But uh, it's sickening as it is. It seems to be pretty prevalent within the culture, which was bizarre because I remember doing a Shura where everybody's going nuts. Um, this guy comes in. There's about eight of us in there. And this guy starts going nuts. And he goes, what is what is the problem? And said, blah, 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 blah. well, we don't want this guy in the meeting. Do you remember this? Yeah, yeah. We don't we don't want this guy in the meeting. Well, why don't you want this guy in the meeting? Well, because he's gay. Right. What do you mean? Because he's gay, we don't want him in the meeting. Well, then how do you know he's gay? Because we all slept with him. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. You know, so for time out here, you got to leave. Sorry, uh, the rest of the senior elders don't want you. But right. it was just such a bizarre deal to be in, and um, and to have such intolerance of people and i think that's probably going back to culture and religion right yeah. so it's it's yeah. hard things to say you know but then we go into the government and we try to reform now for you guys to understand what we did as we mentored the uh senior leadership there as chuck would try to mentor what the right wrong thing to do we had an afghan from dallas texas plano come over and volunteer told the state department hey i'm afghani I want to come back and help and help my country. Thank you so much for delivering us from evil. And he comes back and he's in charge of the payroll for the Afghan National Police. You remember this one? The oh, dude yeah. Brand new passports for all of his family. Yeah. And then fake passports. And then he freaking took $20 million of U.S. taxpayer dollars and, and is gone. I mean, the FBI, as far as I know, was still looking for this dude. Right. And then you had corruption, right? You had Mohammed. What was his name? Duad. Duad. Yeah, Duad Duad. Duad Duad. I, I just always remember his first last yeah. name was the same. So Mohammed Duad Duad, what did that guy own? A horse farm in Middleburg. Another house right by Robert Duval. Yep. Yeah. With an American wife and three sons. And then he was married to an Afghan woman. And I don't remember how many children he had there, but he had the largest house in Kabul. And we paid him $850 a month. Yeah. 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 Where did he get all? Oh, he was the minister of narcotic or counter narcotics. Yeah. Counter so, narcotics. Yeah. So Chuck, I wish for you to tell the PEF to <laughs> cut down Muhammad's crops over there. And do you remember? All right. So this is the other thing that drove me nuts as a, uh, all right. So I was, the, I was the PMA political military affairs. So I, I even got a little, yeah. I even got a little badge, right? So right. U S embassy political military affairs. Yeah, PMA. There you go. And I got, and also I was on the presidential protective service detail for Karzai. So I got to go to all the meetings. I was kind of a free floater. And my right. job was to collect intel 
from you guys from these different cells to put right. together the briefs for my boss, the one star Colonel Palmer, and then uh, the one star uh, General Walters for the ambassador. So right. I worked for the ambassador. So I was like the embassy spy. And as I collected stuff, it would drive me nuts because I go to one meeting, I would hear a stat, I'd write it down. Wow, that's interesting. Then I go to a next meeting and they had cut that stat in half. And then right. by the time it got up to the general, the PowerPoints, it was bare bones and it wasn't even at all what the guys had discussed seven levels down in their working cells. And so that was frustrating to me to see that sort of um, bureaucracy going on as a, a as a free agent. Right. Because I wasn't beholden to your cell or uh, AMPs or ANCOPs or FDD mm -hmm. or anything. I could go and visit everybody and attend and be one of the guys, which I enjoyed. But um, that drove me nuts. And then as I was sitting there thinking about it, the corruption, here we are trying to tell a guy like that, you keep, the PEF, they brought, yeah. uh, for, for you guys, it was called the Poppy Eradication Forces. Yeah. And we brought brand new John Deere bush hog tractors out. And we got weed whackers. You remember they have all these oh, yeah. gas power yeah. weed whackers. Yeah. And the Afghan police are out there, the PEF police, yeah. Poppy Eradication Force, with these weed whackers cutting down poppies. Yeah. And then every every week we were getting these grandiose, we cut down 10 acres of poppies. And they go up to the farmer and they go, hey, we're going to give you 10,000 American dollars if you let us cut your poppies down. Yeah. And the guy's like, yeah, sure. So he takes the thing, they cut all the weeds down. Well, then we brought that guy, that horticulturalist guy from Texas A&M in, right. and, and he goes out there with them, and he goes, you've been paying these guys to cut their poppies down? And he goes, yeah, we're doing a great job. And he goes, well, they've already harvested the poppies, so you're paying him $10,000 to cut all the weeds down. And they're like, what? And then yeah. they go up, and he shows them the poppy where you take your razor blade, and you slice right. it, and, yeah. you, and you get the goop out, and that's how you get the resin to make yeah. it, and they just stick it in the cave or whatever, yeah. but... To me, that was uh, one of those brilliant failures that you that you just couldn't – you can't write about that in a book. I don't think anybody's ever told that story until now with tall no. tales, but well, that one killed I've me. got another one to go along with that. So one afternoon, uh, General Cone calls me up and says, hey, Chuck, come up to the office. So I get up there, and he goes, listen. He says, the, the ambassador to the United Nations mission – Mr. You know, Ambassador Kai Ida is just livid with us. Go over and take my ass chewing for me. <laughs> and I said, why do I have to do it? And he looks at me and goes, I'm the general, you're the colonel. And I go, you know, I always forget that part. And he goes, get out of my office. So I go over there to find out what has happened. And apparently we've taken C-130 transports down into Hellman province, way down in the south, right. and used Agent Orange and killed all the poppies. And probably 50 million goats, too. Yeah, so the U.N. ambassador is just, he's just upset about the whole thing. This is terrible. This is horrible. We're going to make a thing out of this. Well, so I go back and I tell General Cohn, and Bob says, you know, Chuck, get on your airplane, go down there and sort this out. Now, here was the thing. We didn't have any C-130s. We didn't have any Agent Orange. It wasn't our mission to eradicate the poppies. So the U.S. had nothing to do with this, as was so many misdirection stories in Afghanistan on a daily basis. So I go down there with a large delegation from the United Nations and from the European Commission and European Union and New Poll and all these guys. And we took, you know, the Brits down there because they were responsible for this. And we checked all over the place. Couldn't All we saw was poppies for as far as the eye could see. They're big, beautiful flowers, about three feet high. Nothing's dead. So I come back and I say, General Cohn, here's what we ought to do. Tomorrow you're going to go over and you're going to report to the UN ambassador and tell him the story. But I says, here's what I think we ought to do. Why don't you go over and apologize for having sprayed down all the poppies? He goes, but Chuck, we didn't do it. I says, don't you see? That's the beauty of the apology. He goes, get out of my office. <laughs> <laughs> but no. So he went over and, and of course they showed photos and said, hey, Somebody made all this up. It's not even our job, you know. But that was a that was a problem constantly, as you recall, Taco. That you know about what once a week we killed a wedding party of a hundred people at two in the morning out in the middle of nowhere, and then when you go to find where they were, the locals would say, "Oh, we already buried everybody except for the six Taliban guys." 
Yeah, and we can't and we we can't let you dig up the bodies as per custom. <laughs> so we'll pay you almost two hundred dollars for for fifty right. people. And yeah. Then, and then I remember the year the FBI brought in those uh, side penetrating scanners. Right. Yeah. And so they go, where did you bury them? And they go over there. <laughs> and they go over there and they do the side scan. There was there was like a camel. There was a you know goat. <laughs> There was That's there right. was like maybe three people, but um, they're like, nope, nope, you guys, eh, you only get one hundred and fifty dollars. That's right. You know, they didn't like that very much. No. It, you know, but when you sit there and look at the living conditions, guys, if if you ever yeah. been in Afghanistan, this was a shot. We went out to an area. We were delivering stuff. Here's a guy. You can see him. He's one leg uh, fighter. Probably kill me if he could. And then. In the background, you see those apartments. Those people live in all of those apartments back yeah. there. And they just come right out here and they go to the bathroom right in the rocks. And and that's their restroom right there. It doesn't smell that great. Um, the hygiene over there is is horrendous. If you're driving down the road, and here's, here's a shot typical in the city with all the walls and the little buildings that they lived in. But you remember that driving, driving oh, down the yeah. highway, you know, stuff like this. You're just waiting for the accident to happen. That's right. Um, you know. And, yeah. Yeah. And so as you're, as you're sitting here going through and looking at stuff, this was in Herat. This was the graveyard. The, yeah, that's right. Yeah. The yeah. tank graveyard that we went to go visit. And there's a 19. I would love to have that as a collector. But that's a 1945 Russian T-34. Yeah. Yeah. And how it ended up there, I have no clue. But. Um, you know, how, how did my, my world war one German helmet end up in Afghanistan? Yeah. But, uh, they had, they really had some interesting stuff for sure. Um, out there in the general area. Sorry about that. Made a little mess here. Uh, coffee, but, um, how do you, how do you take all that stuff and try to teach? We were talking about corruption. So you remember when we were there and we're telling that one guy, you know, you can't, you can't be grifting. You can't, uh, they would take the Afghan police and they would take their pay and they would go $1 for me or $1 for you, two for me on payday. And so then we came up with a brilliant idea that we're going to give all of the Afghan police guys uh, debit cards. And we bought these ATM machines and then trying to find a place that had power to power it oh it was the wrong voltage yeah. oh god okay so now we finally get the power converters to be able to work these atm machines right. and so then now the police chief goes up and he makes the kid withdraw his money from the atm and then takes half so right. the corruption never ended uh the ring road the local police chiefs would set up checkpoints so all the jingle trucks that were driving around the ring road the russians built big highway they would get robbed and yeah. um, or extortion fees and whatever. And then and then you've got the um, um, that didn't work. Then you had the guys weren't dumb. Right. So they joined the police. They got paid one hundred dollars a month. They got that ATM card. They were in there for a month. Then they would um, go AWOL and they would go join the army, got paid one hundred and fifty dollars a month. Yeah. Um, and so then they were double dip until our guys figured out, hey, wait a minute. You can't be a both. Yeah, you can't do both, man. Got to cut this guy off. But boy, that was two hundred fifty bucks a month. That guy was like living like a king. When you yep. think about it, young. So after the the ATM thing didn't work, and remember, I had the trust fund for the paying everybody, right? So my guys come into me one afternoon, and and just for our viewing audience, let me tell you, Afghanistan was a hard place to live, work, and fight. Even as a tough war fighter, everything we did was difficult, and it wore you down pretty quick. So I'm pretty tired one afternoon and my guys come in to see me and they go, hey, sir, we got this great idea to get around the corruption. We're going to pay the police with cell phones or you we're going to pay the police on their cell phones. And I said, hold on a minute. It's going to take me a minute to get my nine mil out and shoot you three. (laughs) I was going to shoot my majors. They go, no, 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 sir. Listen, hear us out. So the idea was that each Afghan would get a code one, two, three, four. And that code would show up on his phone. And we gave every one of them those flip top phones. And 
And so it would say he's owed $125. And then an agent would come out, a trusted, vetted agent would come out and pay the young Afghan soldier down in Patika or out in Zabal or, you know, Hellman, wherever, would pay him his $100. Right. And that and that's how we knew that this is the right kid. He's got the right code. The agent knows all the codes and that kind of thing. But as we found out, as soon as he gave him the 100 you gave 50 of it to the governor and then 20 of it to the police chief and 10 of it to your police sergeant and you got you walked away with your two bucks. So yeah. that didn't work either. <laughs> but that was the latest in a long line of brilliant ideas that did not work to beat corruption. There, there were a lot of ideas. There were a lot of great ideas. You know, we were going to come in there and change the world. I, I got to say, you know, in terms of how I feel, right now iraq i didn't really care about it yeah. you could you could burn that place down i didn't meet the locals the only bad uh, iraqis i met were wounded that came through our hospital and then we shipped them off to abu grave so i didn't have that affinity with any of the yeah. iraq population i go to afghanistan i'm flying all around the country and do trips with you or take yeah. off and go expect inspect some police place up in jalalabad or whatnot and so i kind of felt the connection with the locals, especially yeah. when we did those VCR trips, the yeah. visitor community relations. Right. Um, so I had a lot more affinity. And then to see the way that we went out now, honestly, 18 years ago, we should have ripped the Band-Aid off 18 years ago when all we had was special forces in there. Yeah. If Mitch Bell was dictator, if I was dictator back then, right. I would have said, bomb the living hell out of them, bring the B-2s in, bomb them up, special forces, Northern Alliance, Drives the bad guys down, we wax them, and that was it, right? Because Taliban, that's like going in and taking out the Taliban is like coming over here and taking out Republicans. Yeah. You know, they're a party. They're, yeah. they're, they're a it. political party. That's it. They're bad guys, yeah. but they're a political party. The Al-Qaeda was who we were going after. So then when we moved in, and I remember looking at that little small embassy we had, and all of a sudden they built this big giant compound. And right. then Obama comes over, uh, Senator Obama comes over, and I'm walking around the corner and nearly run the guy over, and he's out there smoking a cigarette. Right. And, and so I stop and start talking to him and whatnot. You know, it's like, um, he's like, this is very impressive. This is very nice. This is nice. I'm like, yes, sir, it's nice. Uh, where's your apartment? Oh, it's up there. He said, yeah. uh, they're not letting you smoke in there? No, I'm not allowed to smoke in there. Not even on the balcony? He goes, no, I can't smoke on the balcony. I said, okay. Well, I said, whatever you do, you're kind of high. Don't stick your head up above that that shield they have there yeah that wall because sniper's going to get you really <laughs> like oh yeah yeah sniper's going to get you and we got a really nice embassy and um yeah. and i don't know all that money wasted that's kind of pisses me off too that <sighs> we would do that as well so you know i put a question out there if anybody had some great ideas on on trying to do a better plan i think I think a corporal could come up with a better exit strategy than we had recently, yeah. unfortunately. And, um, and God love it. Um, I watched on the news today as they were saying $85 billion worth of equipment. We want it back. Yeah. Are you kidding me? You think the tallywhacker is going to give you the MVGs back no. and all of the vehicles and the helicopters and the planes. You're just going to have to go in there and just start, just start dropping drone bombs on all these guys, but they've got drone jammers. You know, who's to say, who's to say with such a porous border that we have that these forward thinking guys, knowing that we're going to leave uh, September 11th, six months ago, didn't start sending troops down to South America, come up through the border, come across. And on September 11th, we have a nice little anniversary. Yeah. I mean, who's to say that that's not a, uh, a plan out there and the um, it was bad as I felt for all those guys on the C-17 that hung on the gear and took off. If I was the air crewman, uh, the AC, I would have done the same thing because yeah. I mean, it only takes one of those guys chuck a hand grenade up into the uh, oh, yeah. engine yeah. or a rifle or a rock, fod the engine out. Now everybody's there. Could you imagine yeah. the bodies of the Americans being drug off the airplane by the tallywhackers? So yeah. Taliban. 
But uh, let's see, what else did, did we hit? Uh, the borders. You talked about the borders. Yeah. There are no borders with Pakistan. Yeah. Pakistan's more concerned with India. You know, you can yeah. look yeah. at a satellite of India and Pakistan. The lights go all the way down the entire border. And then plus they raped us at the uh, at the passes and everywhere else to take things right. in there. That that was a waste of money. Um, and oh, they would just go across the border and recoup. Well, you know, you talk about Pakistan. Interesting story is I got to know the uh, the Indian defense attache that was stationed in Kabul and their embassy was right across from. The, yeah, the Minister of Interior. So I'm over there in the Minister of Interior one morning and all of it. I'm on the fifth floor. I'm walking down the hall, going to the minister's office. The next thing I know is I end up on the ground. The bomb I'm blew up. I was there. Yeah. Yeah. I got knocked to the ground and I rolled over and I pulled out my nine millimeter and I go, well, I guess this is it. I'm going to die in this hallway, the, the lone American. What had happened, of course, across the street is the Pakistan. And I forget what ISI was. It was yeah. their intelligence service or something. The Pakistani intelligence service was trying to kill the Indian ambassador and missed his vehicle, but got the next three using a vehicle born IED, which means that's a car that drives up right and gets into your, your convoy and, and the guy sets himself off and killed my good friend, the Indian uh, defense attache. And I'm thinking, I just nearly got killed by Pakistan trying to kill India. That was another one of those complicated issues we dealt with. This There wasn't just one art, one bad guy in country. Right. There was multiple, you know. Yeah, we and, were over there for a meeting when that blew and blew all the windows out in the yeah, gym. Yeah. And that, yeah. And the God. poor Af Afghans, they opened their office doors and looked out and saw this big American colonel with all his or a body or going, oh my God. And I've got this pistol in my hand and they're looking at me like he's going to shoot us. And I'm like, I'm not going to shoot you, you know, yeah. get back in your offices. Well, here, here's, here's a, a picture of a typical meeting yep. that we'd go to. And you had everybody sitting around here's over at the base. So you would attend all these different meetings. Everyone would do the reports, kill the, the, uh, PowerPoints. And then, you would attend these meetings and here's these uh, guys probably absconded with about $150 million of taxpayer money and they're gone as well right. nowadays. But uh, then we go to these meetings, get their reports and how great they were doing. Then those reports would all get combined and written up and, um, and presented to General Cohn, who would then do them up and present them to um, – the ambassador's office over at right. the embassy and, and everything. All right. I, I will tell one story. My boss, Colonel Palmer right here. There you go at the market. Right. Love that guy. Colonel Palmer calls me up and goes, Hey, taco. Um, could you get somebody to brief the ambassador tomorrow on whatever, regional training center rtc we had just stood up and i'm like yeah sure so i i had started a cigar club on wednesday nights you remember that the choir yep, practice yep. Uh -huh. and i got more work done in the choir practice with all the army guys because i got to tell you you army guys keep your cards close to your chest right you know because there's not that camaraderie like every marine goes through quantico and ocs and tbs right you guys could be national guard you could go through right. this this west point whatever so it's like getting everybody together becoming friends and then it would be like smoking a cigar and I go, Hey, Johnny, you know, John George, major, right. major general retired now. Hey, yeah. Johnny, man, have you got that? Can I get a look, see of that, uh, you know, the uh, PowerPoint on that RTC? He goes, well, it hasn't been approved yet. So we're not allowed to release it. I go, dude, I'm not going to release it. I just want to write up a report yeah. and give it to my boss. So yeah, sure. Bring a power stick over. So I, I bring a stick over and get it. Well, then, he tells me to go get a uh, the head of the RTC guy. I can't remember the colonel's name. So I go over there and I tell the colonel, hey, the ambassador would like a um, progress report. Do you mind coming over and briefing the ambassador? And he goes, oh, you'd have to ask my boss, your boss. Yeah, the chief of staff. Right. You want me to ask the chief of staff to get you? Okay, fine. So I go back and uh, General Iardi, 
and I write this very, very, very nice, polite, one paragraph deal. Jill, dear General Iardi, uh, the ambassador requests a 10-minute uh, brief on RTC North's developments. Right. Blah blah blah. I am requesting Colonel So and So to be the the briefer. If that's okay with you, I'll uh, green light this. And and I'm like, before I send it, I try to get a hold of my boss, tell him, hey, this is what I'm doing. And he's in the meeting with the general and the other colonel, and I can't get him out. And so finally, I make the command decision. I do it. Doosh! I hit fire. It goes to Iardi. Iardi, Iardi reads it. Walks into Cone's office and says. Hey, Taco just sent me this thing. I hope it's okay. We're going to have Colonel so-and-so right. brief the ambassador. Cone spools up and says, nobody briefs the ambassador except for me. <laughs> and so then this poor colonel is yeah. ginning up this report to go to spool up Colonel uh, General Cone to go to the ambassador. Well, then that night, we bombed a wedding party. And that's oh, yeah. we were tracking the, the cell of like eight guys. And yeah. they go up, and there's this big giant tent with armed dudes around it. And they go into the tent. Well, because of customs, they're allowed in, and they're accepted into the wedding party and all that. Well, we're like, bad guys! And and they drop, they drop like two two bombs on this thing right. and blow and kill everybody. So now the ambassador is now not talking about wanting a brief. He's got to meet with Karzai. And so that whole thing went off. But um, I got my butt chewed. By General Walters, he calls me up and says, yeah. you know, do you know what chain of command is? I'm like, yes, sir. Of course. And he goes, well, then why did you send that request? I go, because my boss asked me. You had him in the meeting. You kept him in there for two hours. I had to make a command decision before everybody split. But anyway, it was uh, it was kind of funny because that was kind of politics, that petty politics that you'd see. But yeah. the funny thing is that next day, right, the wedding party thing is the big deal. Colonel Palmer calls me up and goes, hey, Taco. Um, I need you to go to the Ark, which was right next door to my building. Yeah. I yeah. need you to go to the Ark. The general's having an um, impromptu meeting. I want you just to sit in the back, take notes, anything that concerns the embassy, get back to me, but don't say a word. I'm like, roger that, sir. So I go in there and I sit, and the sergeant major is blocking my view of the general, and the uh, sergeant, big sergeant major. And the general is sitting there berating the embassy. Those blah 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 blah, and then General I already sitting at the end of the table. His eyes get kind of big, and he looks over like this. And Cone shuts up, and he leans around the sergeant major, and he goes, he looks down at my badge, and he goes, "You work at the embassy, don't you?" I go, "Yes, sir, I do." And here he's been bad mouthing my boss and everybody else. Oh yeah, yeah. And I already that's I'll jump off a cliff for I already because I already right. goes, "Hey, sir." Taco's good to go. He's one of us. That's right. And yeah. he goes, and I'm like, sir, not a word. And I never did go back and report all that stuff. But yeah. uh, I did enjoy hanging out with my my boys over at Eggers. I yeah, yeah. And and uh, Tony Irardi, good guy. I saw him later. We were all back in the Pentagon together. He went on to two stars. Did really well. And, uh, you know, it's funny how you these people you see in combat and you're going, is this combat? And I think for our, our, our listening audience, you know, you don't fight every single day. You're not pulling a trigger every single day. There's we never period, did. I mean, there, yeah, where you don't do anything. Shot. That's right. Or you do something, you know, so somebody's out there. But <clears throat> there are moments of terror and there's moments of excitement. There's moments of concern. You know, we used to get this list every morning called the BOLO list. And it was on the on the zipper net, the classified net called the, and the BOLO stood for be on the lookout. And it was be on the lookout for a white Toyota vehicle born IED. So this is a this is a, a Toyota full of of uh, C4 that's going to the guy's going to blow himself up. The Always on the way was, to the airport. That's right. The problem was in Afghanistan every Toyota was white. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that that yeah. my first my first week there when the donkey I came out of the meeting with the police chief and I see right. this little boy with the switch and he's running down the street yelling to try and stop the donkey. So I right. run out in the street and I stop this donkey right here. Right. And you can see my PTS uh, sergeant back behind right. me with the M4. He looked down at the side of that donkey. See the propane tank on right. the side? Oh, yeah. That guy came up to me and said, Colonel, if you ever pull that shit again, I'll shoot you myself. That's and right. I'm like, what? What? I was just trying to stop the donkey, sergeant. And he goes, sir, they had sacrificed that kid in a heartbeat to kill you. 
Yeah. I'm like, you know what? I've been here a week. I'd like to go home to my wife. I tell you, you tell me jump and, and I'll say how high. You yeah. know, you've got the experience I don't, and I'm just a stupid aviator, and I get it. And he goes, look at that, sir. They could have put damn uh, C4 underneath that thing. They could have had charges in there, blown us, blown us all up. And, yeah. it, and it, it always made me think, suicide born donkey, right? <laughs> IED. Why How do you not? pronounce that one? Su- suicide donkey V I B E D or something. But uh, yeah. I mean, it was a, it was definitely an interesting time to be over there. This there was a picture I have a story with this one. There was a guy on a motorcycle and that was my biggest fear was driving. So if you were Lieutenant Colonel and above, you could self-drive. If yep. you were a major and below, you had to have a rider with you. Remember that? Yeah. So we could drive around. Some Colonel made that rule. So he didn't have to have a driver with him. Yeah. But I was sitting there one day and I hear the motorcycle coming up behind me and I'm stuck in traffic and I see the guy and then I see the blue orb behind him. So I'm thinking he's probably okay. He's got the woman and wife on the back. Well, he pulls up next to me, and I take this shot as he's passing. Now, notice he's got a helmet on. Do you think she has a helmet on uh, underneath no. that? Uh, no. So here comes this blue uh, orb she's wearing, and she yeah. gets up about three cars ahead of us, of my car, and her burker gets stuck in the chain, oh. and they crash. And this guy gets up off the motorcycle and takes his helmet off, and starts beating his wife with the helmet. Yeah. And I'm going, just just amazing. Yeah. Um, it was a different culture. And, that you know, you're not going to fix that one overnight. No. And then, all right, so Camp Eggers, for those who had never been there, Camp Eggers was a neighborhood. It literally was uh, a neighborhood looked like this. And they had just gone in there and put giant walls and HESCOs and walls all around our our area. So we'd take it over some neighbor, nice neighborhood yeah. with houses. And so we had all the houses. Then we had all the stuff moved in that we needed. And like I said, right next to my building was the Ark. And the Ark held a uh, Canadian general, uh, I think Australian general, yeah. Bone, yeah. Iardi, and some other guy. And then right next to the wall, uh, outside of my house, I had a little um, uh, oh, platform you could sit out there and smoke cigars. Right. And the wall was right there. And every like clockwork, every Thursday, this big giant truck would pull up and the guy would throw a big four by six plank across from the top of his truck, across the wall, take his hose, jump onto the top of the PSD's shack, uh, Canadian um, personal support. And they would jump down and he would go fill the generators with uh, diesel. And I kept thinking to myself, you know what? That would be a perfect target. Like if I yeah. had a suicide car, I would drive up, blow that thing up, or I would have a truck with a bunch of guys in an empty one, run up, throw that board over, and then and everyone jump out and they go. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, no, all of a sudden, now you've got 20 bad guys in there shooting everybody. And, of course, every Army kid in that base is walking around in PT gear with an M16 and no magazine. Right. They, like I was at the chow hall and I saw this. Oh, yeah. Hey, so what would you do if the, the, you know, Hodges came in the wire and, and we're shooting guys? Well, I'd shoot them back, sir. I said, really, with what? Because you're wearing uh, PT gear and I sure don't see an extra magazine for that. And that made her think. And she was like, oh, yeah, 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 that's exactly but, right. But then when I left my replacement sitting at his desk and he's typing a report and this giant explosion hits, right? He drops down and we had all that chicken wire in the windows and right. blew all of the glass out. And he's underneath his desk. As he's sitting there, this burned body lands right there on the porch next to my desk. Yeah. And it lands there, the upper torso. And he doesn't know who it is. It turns out to be the bad guy. So the bad guy was in his uh, suicide car. Uh He's supposed to go do my little trick I told you about behind the gas truck. He goes racing up and he hits the back of that truck and lights his IED off, uh, the car off. It It was the septic truck. Oh, oh, <laughs> they, they had the septic line. So not only did it blow crap all over, it blew this guy up. And I think it I think it wounded some guys, but um, didn't kill anybody. But he blew up the septic truck because that Ooh. truck looked like the same like a gas truck. And there was yeah, oh, yeah. Plank, and he had the hose and he was sucking all the septic tanks out. And um, yeah, that was 
that was pretty bad. That was exciting for him, but uh, not fun. Well, we had an interesting event with, uh, we talk about septic trucks. So Bob Cohn decided that every two weeks, the colonels would get together and have the council of colonels. And there was 12 of us. And, and he would give us these, he would write down all week long, all the thing or every two weeks with the things that he thought were the toughest things to solve. And sometimes there was no solution. And so we would sit around and we'd try to come up with a solution. And of course, as we knew, Taco, everything in Afghanistan was the hardest solution. Right. But I, I, a little shout out to uh, the engineers and particularly the Seabees. I've never seen a bunch of Navy guys happier to be away from the ocean. Those Seabees were building roads and digging wells and putting up walls. And I think if they never saw the ocean again, they were fine because they were doing what they had been trained to do. So the CB captain comes in, and we're sitting at our at the at, you know the conference table. We got little name tags there and everything. And in front of each one of us is a very nice smooth rock. And he says, "Gentlemen, I need to tell you something. I need your help." He says, "You see the rock before you? On our seven forward operating bases that we're using for training, where we're training both police and we're training um, the army." The young recruits go out and find themselves a rock, and they use that rock to wipe after they go to the bathroom. Oh, God. And then they throw it in the porta potty. And of course, when the septic truck comes to suck out the porta potty, the fan blades inside the septic truck get tore up by the rocks. So he says it's particularly happening for the police. And he looks over at me and he goes, Chuck. So I look over at my. At my S seven, my training guy, and I go, and these the majors are looking at me like, you got to be kidding me, sir. And I go, nope. We need some kind of a training class on how to properly conduct hygiene for your behind and defecate. Right. That's right. So, so they they put it together and they get it and they get it out to all the fobs and everything. So months go by, nothing happens. About three months later, we come into the meeting. And there in front of each one of us is a rock wrapped in toilet paper. <laughs> they only understood half of the training. They didn't get it all. No, that, that was my first experience going to Jalalabad and yeah. a two hour drive up to Fort Apache, the Bronx up there looking at the Torbor mountains and yeah. it's this big Hesco castle up right. on the hill. So they got yeah. the high ground. That's cool. Yeah. Before I left, there was a Marine major and I can't remember his name. He was the S four guy. And he goes, Hey, sir, I got to give you a brief before you go out there. I'm like, okay, what's up? They got brand new trucks and these rat bastards are always doing this and you know, look for, they steal the tires off of them and they right. go sell them in town. They put cheap retreads on. They want us to get new ones. They try to bring in the broken AK 47s and say that this theirs right. and they sold the, the good one to the Taliban. You know, right. they do this, they sell the gas, they do this, they do this. They, oh, okay, fine. So I go out there and I can't remember the guy I'm with. I always say Hans the German dude or whatever, but we go out there and uh, we got the Terp with us and he goes, uh, we're walking up. And right before I come to Afghanistan, my wife watches all those crazy uh, mystery TV shows, you know, medical diagnosis and oh, it was yeah, about yeah. flies. It was about how flies the germs and, and they go for your mouth and your eyes and transmit the germs. So I'm right. kind of a germaphobe about these flies. And right. as we're walking around, it's high, it's hot, dry, and the flies are attacking. They're coming under your glasses. And they're getting in your mouth when you're talking and you're spitting them out. And it was horrible. And then I remember the, uh, the guy's giving us a tour of his base and he goes, blah, 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 blah. and the interpreter's like, Oh, Colonel Bell, uh, this is the headquarters, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. And then we walk a little further and he goes, blah, 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 blah. this is our comfort station. I'm like, Oh, I heard about this. So we put a comfort station out there trailer, right? Yeah. Same deal. They take the little, triangle rocks and use that in their butts they throw it in there and it gummed up all the stuff so the engineers come out take a sawzall take all the toilets out they took a sawzall and cut all the guts out of the bottom took a backhoe and dug yeah. this big giant deep slit trench right and then, and then they had the two footprints painted on the uh, thing with the hole so the guy because they're not going to they'd stand on the toilet seat and bust it away right. and then now they got the hole they got the two footprints they got your little guys instructions on how to take a poop and how to properly do it right. and so then um now we're walking along and there's a million flies well where are the flies coming from they're coming from the shitter right next to the shitter and there's our kitchen 
<laughs> and I look over, and this dude's got this big knife, and there is a black sheep hanging there. And I thought, you know, oh. I haven't seen any like black sheep, you know. But the guy goes whack, and all the flies the go off the there. meat. Yeah. And it's it's red, and then back, and and then it's black again. And I turned and I looked at the German guy, looked at the interpreter, and I said, "Hey, uh, Tasha Kor, tell the uh, police chief. Very thankful, but we can't." Um, we can't stay for lunch. Right. And uh, we have a meeting with the general in Jalalabad. We have to right. get back. And and it, you would have thought I just got caught screwing this guy's goat. Oh, yeah. And I mean, his eyes got kind of big in the uh, interpreter. And he goes, oh, Colonel, I, uh, I cannot tell the uh, police chief that. Sure, you can. Go ahead. Tell him. He goes, yeah. no, no, no. Colonel, this would uh, cause a major problem because uh, uh, he paid for that goat out of his own salary. So, so yeah. we must eat. It would uh, lose face. <laughs> I'm like, I look at the other guy and I go, you up for this? And he goes, yes, man, I guess, whatever. So we get the rest of the tour, play with RPGs and the whole nine yards. Right. And then we go to lunch. So we go and it's a Connex box. And they open up the back and you walk in. There's food all over the floor, rice and stuff. Flies everywhere. And I'm walking in now. I'm just like, this is driving me nuts. And we walk all the way to the front and they open up the front of it. And he, the police chief sees me getting frustrated with the flies. And these two dudes scurry off. They come back with this big giant fan and a generator and they fire it up. And the fan's now blowing all the flies down to the other end. And they, they bring all this food in and it's all that meat. And it's uh, the bread, which was phenomenal. Right. The watermelon, all that. So we're sitting there eating in the rice, and it was the best meal I've ever had. But by the time we got back into the truck and we're driving back, my partner is sitting there, and he's like, oh, oh, Taco, I don't feel so good. I'm like, what? And so we're halfway. It's a two-hour drive. We're halfway. He's got to stop. He's screaming. you got to stop. And the, and, the, and the two Army, they were Hawaiian National Guard guys. They had the Humvees, and we're in the uh, right. armored pickup truck and with the Dynacor dudes. Right. And they're like, we can't stop here. And he goes, either you stop now or I am going to soil my pants. And so they stopped and set up a little perimeter and the guy did his business. He did that about four times. By the time we got back, he lived in the bathroom that whole night. Yeah. By the time we got the dude on the helicopter, he crapped himself on that hip going back to Kabul. He rode in the back of a pickup truck because he had soiled himself. He was so bad. Right. And he's curled up and we get him straight to the hospital. So we go to the hospital, put him in there and he's on IVs. And I say to the doc, I go, I ate the same stuff this guy ate. So how come I'm not crippled up dead? And he goes, are you on the Monday malaria pill or the daily doxycycline? I said, uh, doxycycline, because I heard the, the nightmares were really bad. Yeah. And he says, yeah, all spectrum antibiotics, man. It probably killed it off. No worries. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you, that dude, he's changed, man. He changed over to the daily doxycycline because right. we're always drinking the tea at the yeah. churros and eating the food. And I came home and I remember taking that Vermox, those three, yeah. like 300 milligram horse pill to kill everything in your gut and worms and stuff coming out in your poop. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't realize all that crap was inside me. But um, yeah, it was a uh, very interesting time do you guys out there listening there are 23 people live on right now that have been in and out listening but 23 hardcore listeners have questions i've got one question here did either of you work with colonel richard paul mcfoy retired you know 2008 but then worked for dynacore god that guy's name sounds really familiar hmm well, he was down in Minsticky. So if he was in Minsticky, he'd have been down in Iraq. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So no. But he did do something with C. Sticka. I remember, you know, Alan West was over there. Yeah. Let's see if we got any other questions. I wrote about what do we do with all the arms left over there? Nobody gave me any good ideas. You know, I put on here all my vets thoughts on how we could have E&E'd out better. Right. Well, how about keeping the military presence up there and all the stuff? Well, you know, one of the reasons, Taco, that we gave the 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 army the M sixteen yeah. is we knew that they would not be able to get five point five six ammo as easily as they can get the AK seven point six two. 
That yeah. was a that was a conscious decision that if something ever went south and we pulled out, and that's a, a consideration to remember about all that equipment, whether it's the the helicopters or whether it's the vehicles, they're gonna have to have they're gonna have to maintain them and they don't know how because they cannot read nor write and they haven't been through maintainer training or operator training. You know, in time, all of that equipment will just be on the side of a road unless they pay big money for some outside agency to bring in parts and pieces. And I don't know. Well, that's, they, you know. They scared all the guys that know how to work on them that were trained on them. They right. just basically threatened to kill them all and kill their family. Yeah. So they're not going to get them back. So you're, you're yeah. right to a point. There's going to be a point. But if they've actually got all those warehouses full of ammo and stuff, they're well supplied for a long time. Well, that's true for quite a while, but eventually they will run out, you know. So. Let's see. Different problems between the religious differences within the Islamic region. Well, that I saw that more in Iraq between yeah. the the religions there. To me, that was that was almost a Catholic that was a Catholic Protestant fight in in Iraq. You didn't see that over in Afghanistan. Because Afghanistan is more tribal. They don't yeah. they're not they don't consider themselves Afghani. They consider themselves Pashtun or, or whatever yeah, their weaker, yeah. alliance to a, a tribe is. Right. And province leaders, lack of education, what um, really the Afghan people. You know, I wrote in my story about a little boy that I met in my interpreter. We I, I do magic tricks, so I was doing coin tricks for the kid. <laughs> And he goes, where, where are you from? And I explained to the kid, yeah. I pulled an orange out of my bag that I had from breakfast. And I took a Sharpie and I drew a little rough outline of the world. And I put an X in Texas and I put an X in Afghanistan. And I told the guy, this is the earth. The earth is round. And the guy, kid's like, uh-uh, earth is flat. No, no, the earth is round. No, you know, the I-bomb says the earth is flat. Right. And, I mean, this is a kid growing up there and i said no i explained to him the earth's round we're here i live over here i have family showed him pictures of my kids over on this side and you would have thought that blasphemy you know and then when i told the kid that we landed on the moon which you could see up there oh that kid's like no <laughs> blew his mind so what did they think of us they thought we were russians yeah that kid thought that that we'd come from the north like the russians did and we're white he thought we were Russians coming in there again. When you drove around, they have they have these flags on poles. And all the flags had different colors like red and green. And I, I can't remember. I probably have it wrong. I think the green was you died from the Russians. The red was from some other faction. It, they had different meanings to the colors. Yeah. But uh, when you're driving around, you see graves everywhere with these sticks sticking out with a, a ribbon tied to it. And it meant something to them yeah. uh, in terms of who was alive or, or how they how they were killed. And that's how they represented it. Well, I wonder what color the United States flags are going to be for their for their dead, because even though they claim they won, we definitely killed a lot of yeah. people. Well, regrettably, the truth is, is that if they want to stay where they are, then they're fine. But if they want to progress, and the problem is that, you know, Toyota has the corner of the market in Afghanistan. So that means they brought in the automobile, they brought in fuel. Well, that takes money to maintain that and keep that up, which means it takes an economy. And so if you go back to this kind of agrarian economy that the Taliban have lived off of, even they don't make that much money off of their drug business to sustain a national economy. So they're going to fall back into kind of that feudal tribalism and lose all that stuff. I yeah. mean, they're just not going to move any, any further down the road. And not only did that, did we kill a lot of people, they died naturally. You know, when we were there at the time, you know, um, one in, in three women died from childbirth and one in five children died before the age of two. Yeah. And an average man, I think when we were there in 2008, Live, the average age was 46. It's yeah. not like these guys live to be 90 because they don't have any medicine. They don't have, they don't have medical. They don't have dental. They don't have good, um, you know, uh, diets, you know, and those kind of things. And so it's a tough, tough life for them. And, and it's uh, always, it's always been that way. Yeah. 
always been that way for, I mean, ever since Alexander the Great came through. Right. And the only reason he made it out of there was because he married the tribal elder's daughter. <laughs> and through right. that arranged marriage, was able to escape with his men. And then you look yeah. at the Brits, uh, 15,000 or yeah. I forget that number, it was either 10 or 15,000 Brits finally give up and they're they're marching out and the Afghans killed them all except for the doctor. The, angel the doc who they let him get out and go back to India and tell everybody what happened. Right. And they killed everybody. And we'd be in markets, folks. We'd be in these little bazaars and right. you could buy a rifle if it, was, if it was over 100 years old. And they had these beautiful Lee Enfield rifles and they were charging bucks up the butt and guys were you know, sitting around with a bunch of money. So they buy these things. And one day I'm looking at it and I go, so these, this is original. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's original. So you took that off a dead Brit that was trying to escape from Afghanistan. Oh yes. My countrymen killed the Brits. And I go, Oh, that's cool. So did they get this out of a uh, locker, like a, a rifle locker? And he goes, what do you mean? An armory, you know, with a bunch of other weapons. He goes, I don't know what you mean. I go, all the serial numbers are sequential. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I bet you we could pull all of our rifles together that we have together. Yeah. You know, Tom, uh, yeah, Daniel Boone, that's what they were calling me because I had the long rifle. Right. We could pull all our rifles together, and there's not one serial number that's going to be within 6,000 digits of each yeah. other, which was kind of funny. But, uh, yeah, those guys those guys were pretty funny. If you guys got any questions you want to ask Colonel Busick right now, this would be – oh, wait a minute. Here we do. What are your thoughts on the Talawackers partnering with Russia and or China? Could they sell our equipment to them to reverse engineer? Well, here's my thought. So I met with the the Russian consulate when I was in, in Kabul. That was one of my roles. And the guy was really interesting because his father had been a Soviet colonel in the engineer corps during the invasion. Mm-hmm. And he could tell the story. And he said, you notice we don't have an embassy here in, in, in uh, Kabul because of our relationship, having invaded them and those kind of things. Um, but the Russians, you know, we all, we read all of their books, you know, the bear goes over the hill and all that other stuff. Putin today understands there's no value in wasting your, your, your blood and treasure in that country. Cause you get nothing out of it at the end, other than you got shooken down and they, the Afghans shook down the Soviets. Now the Chinese different story. The Chinese want to come in there and take out all the mineral rights. And well, they already I was, had the mineral rights back then. Well, they, they had some. Them back then. Yeah, they got some, but they want more. So the, there is a there's a discussion that it, they're the largest copper deposits in the world may be under the the, the Hindu Kush, right. but to get it out is very expensive and very dangerous. And the Chinese came to me and said, listen, we built this road from China in down the finger into Afghanistan, and we want you to provide. Afghan police to protect it. I said, why do you want me to do it? And they said, well, you've got the money. I mean, you know, in that country, everybody knows everything about everybody, you know, whether you want to or not. I said, no, you're a private enterprise and we're not going to fund that. And they said, well, we're going to go see your ambassador. And I'm like, really? Go see my, go see my <laughs> president. You can go talk to my president. I just, you know, I don't, sometimes when people want to scare you, well, you know, we'll go to your boss. Well, I hope you do. Um, but in terms of reverse engineering, you know, I currently work for Oshkosh Defense, and we manufacture the replacement for the Humvee, the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, and we manufacture uh, the last MRAP in the Army and Marine Corps inventory called the MATV. Neither of those are in country. Anything that's left in country at this point really is not very sophisticated, would not be worth reverse engineering, and a lot of it was left there on purpose you know, to help transition the Afghans, but go, well, you guys are getting older generation Humvees. You're getting older generation FMTVs, you know. We're going to give you a few hats and a few hemets, but there's really not enough there to reverse engineer. I think that might answer the question. Yeah, plus, you know what, the cost, because there's no road to ship this stuff out to put on ships. You got to fly it out or you got to drive it out or put it on jingle trucks and flatbeds. Right. And the cost is just humongous. So the money that we spent getting a lot of that equipment in there. Now, the Blackhawks and stuff, uh, I don't like the idea of leaving that. But where are you going to find the pilots to fly them? Yeah. You know, and then I think that answered the question. I don't think a lot of that stuff, what I worry about more would be the equipment is in place now. We try to send guys back in there. 
now they don't own the night. Those guys yeah. do. Yeah. How many years would it take to teach the younger generation to read? And is it done at school for boys or girls <laughs> anywhere? I tell you this. Yeah. Bonnie, they would kidnap boys and they would take them to Pan uh, Pakistan. They put them in those schools over in Pakistan to become extremists. They did that. And the girls, well, we built schools and girls could go to school and they're walking home and guys would walk up and throw battery acid in their face. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Terry Linden. Look at that. You remember him? Oh, yeah. Um, Terry, I did tell Ambassador Eikenberry the only solution that would work in Afghanistan was carpet bombing with nuclear weapons. <laughs> Terry, you're exactly, exactly right, brother. And um, that's a true statement. Uh, well, I don't know whether we need to use nukes, <laughs> but the, any any large size explosive weapon would work on you, right? Yeah. You know. I know it's a different area. Anyone work around Erbil around 2011 now? I was 2008, 2009. Yeah. How long did you, uh, you went, no, did you go back that next year or no? Yeah, you were there. You were there. The I was there just all of 2008. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, this is uh, I hope I hope some of our stories weren't too offensive. And um, I can tell you that it was one of the most interesting tours I ever did yeah. in my career as a Marine Corps officer was. And and I was blessed to be with guys like you. I truly was. Yeah. You know, I never advertised this, Terry. Uh, when you guys were over at Eggers, majors were six to a can. Lieutenant colonels were four to a can. I think you colonels were two to a can. And I was over at the embassy, and I had my very own can with two bids, a desk, right. a TV, phone I could call home, internet, a shower right there, um, class six across, <laughs> across the hooch, you know, for all the State Department people. I hung out with the FBI guys. That was my portfolio. The DEA guys were there. The skinny right. boys were upstairs yeah. in the embassy. You know, it makes me wonder what, what, if anything, the embassy is overrun. I haven't seen any pictures, you know. my yeah. uh, What family. will they use it for, you know? Yeah, they, well, you know, it was pretty big blast doors, man. They'd have to, they yeah. locked the doors on the embassy and left. It'd be kind of tough to get in there, I think. And, That's uh, true. You know, when I was out there and the guys gave me a, a Russian burp gun. And I came oh, yeah? back with this Russian burp gun and I, we built a, a little holder and we put it up above the, the door inside of PMA. Oh, and I always wondered, you know, if that thing's still sitting up, it's probably still sitting up there right probably. now. Well, you know, remember in the spring of 2008, when they started hitting the sea stick uh, trainers, because the Afghans were, you know, first thing Taliban says, you know, I don't think they're coming back. I mean, they have, they left in 2001 and nothing's happened. It's been like, you know, it's been sleepy hollow here. So they knew not to go up against the 101st and the 82nd. So they decided to go take on those those uh, trainers. So one of the things that we did is the colonels used to travel alone, and we started traveling together in te in pairs, and we asked for weapons. Well, we couldn't get them. So so Lee Hyde, who we used to call RBG, really big guy because he was 6'5", 220 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and he was our special forces counterintelligence guy. Right. And he was so big, Taco, I could turn sideways and stand behind him, and he yeah. was my body armor. So Lee one night says to me and Steve, he says, hey, guys, tonight we're going to go downtown about 6.30, bring $20 in ones each of you. Because, you know, in Afghanistan, if you handed somebody a $20 bill, they didn't know what it was. Right. They didn't know if it was a $1 bill, $5 bill, 10 or whatever, because they can't they can't read and they can't count. So but they can count kind of ones. So. We went down and we bought three AK-47s from this dude that, you know, RBG knew. And he checked them out and everything. That guy, yeah. That's right. We brought them back and we we set up our own arms room. We went online and figured out all the forms you were supposed to have in the clipboard and this and that and the lock and the double lock and everything. And about three or four days later, the 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 stick of sergeant major comes down. And he goes, "Ben, how you doing?" And we're like, "Uh oh." And he goes, "Hey, I understand you have an arms room." We're like, "Who? Who? What? Who?" He oh, stop it. Where is it? So we unlocked it and opened it up. And he said, "You know, you three are some of the best privates." armorers i have ever met this thing is perfect he goes you guys should have been 96 or 76 whiskeys or whatever you know but we would carry those everywhere we went i remember one day i'm taking all my my battle rattle i'm walking out to my vehicle and i got this ak-47 slung over my back 
and I got I'm on the phone talking to somebody, and here comes General Bob Cohn, and, and I'm going, I know I'm in for an ass whipping on this thing, and he walks up because I got a pistol on a hip, I got a knife on the other, he got the AK, you know. And he stops me and he says, where are you headed? And I said, sir, I'm going out to, to you pole. And then from you pole, I'm going out to the Italian fob. Pole. And he says, okay, be safe. And he looks at me and he goes, Busick, you are such a cowboy. And I said, yes, sir, but I'm going to be an alive cowboy at the end of the day. And he goes, carry on. <laughs> so with that, I think we can wrap this, Taco. Well, I tell you what. We'll talk folks, all night. Yeah, we could, man. We tell good war stories. I tell you what, I yeah. bring you on. By now, it's like uh, sparking all these stories yeah. in my head. I'm sitting there thinking about like uh, Colonel Palmer listens, you know, getting a hold of those poppy seeds. And he yeah. planted that little garden next to his hooch, put yeah. the poppy seeds in there. And he's like, what are all these weeds keep popping up in my <laughs> my tomato plants? <laughs> and those look like poppies, you know. Yeah. Oh, my God. But it was a good time. Chuck, right. thank you so much for coming on tonight. And folks out there i really do appreciate you hanging out for an hour and a half hour and 41 minutes but uh, we will have no tall tales next week no tall tales the following week i've got to go under surgery here and uh, i don't think i'd look really good with my uh crap coming out of my drainage out of my sinuses and get fixed but you guys have a great one um until the next show um i tell you this in october for all my Marines out there that ever watched Heartbreak Ridge, I've got Swede is going to come on the show. Ah, Swede, hey. Swede, yeah, Swede, Swede, really big guy. <laughs> yeah, he's out in California. I emailed him yeah. and he said, "Yeah, sure, I'll come on talk." Yeah. So I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have Swede come on the show. That'll be fun. And then um, I've got some other really interesting stuff. Did you ever read with the old breed? Uh. I've got the book here somewhere. Um, with the old breed by E.B. Sledge. It's probably the best account from a Snuffy's point of view of the battle uh, in the Pacific theater uh, from Okinawa to, you know, Pelu, Okinawa. And um, they're, they're just incredible. And they made the TV series of Pacific. I'm going to have his son, Henry Sledge on the show, yeah. along with my friend, Scott Gibson, who was uh, played Captain Haldine, the actor mm-hmm. in the Pacific, his, his dad's right. CO. So I'm going to have that on. That's going to be in October, I believe. I think the 9th. I think I have the suite on the 12th. And I have those guys on the 19th. Um, might No, September 19th. Yeah, September 19th. So uh, look forward to some of these shows when I get back. Thanks, guys, for the, uh, for the, for the thoughts. I appreciate it. Megan, especially uh, with the surgery. Because thanks to COVID and the Chinese, I've had it twice. I haven't had the jab, and I'm wondering if I need it because the first time was two weeks really bad. Second time was three days of drainage. And what happened was because I have to wear a mask, and I'm constantly wearing a mask at work and whatnot, it got infected. And when it got infected on this side, it's now clogged up and solid, so they have to go in there and root it out. Kind of interesting, right? It's going to smell too. Kevin Meckler. Kevin, I want you as a guest on my show, my friend. This guy, uh, DFC, first Gulf War, flying OV-10s incredible incredible and um megan i'm i'm sorry i that name sounds so familiar dick and he died in 2015 at 57 um sounds really familiar but i'm i'm sorry i have to go back through my list of uh, stuff but until then guys thanks again for uh, uh joining the show if you like the show you like the material go hit hit subscribe share it with your friends Ring the taco bell, as they say, and that gives you alerts when I do pop on with special stuff. So until next week, or not next week, until about two weeks from now, adios, hasta luego. Avidis de chus, shechini, au revoir, domarigato gazamas, tando shinde, kurasai, tashikor. What do you got for me, Chuck? What did I miss? Battle buddy, Semper Fi. <laughs> hey, <laughs> give Sue a hug for me, all right? I will, I will. All right, love Bye you. All. all right, ura. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for hanging out. It was a blast, and I, um, I, I know I probably told some tales I probably shouldn't have, but uh, it really was good to get this out after 13 years. It's been bottled up. Some of the things that uh, frustrate me right now, looking at what's going on with the evacuation, not well done. Um, 
our allies. I'm getting reports from my friends over in the UK about what's going on and their feelings towards us right now, which is not uh, good. And I wish that we could uh, promise our allies that we would do better. And I wonder how our allies in Taiwan are probably thinking about right tonight as they look at some of the stuff going on. So I tell you what, um, let's hope that uh, we get all of our Americans out of there, that we don't lose any of our troops flying airplanes into Kabul and safe passage for all of our guys to get home. We ripped the Band-Aid off. It wasn't the right way to do it. So President Biden, if you listen to me right now, that was the wrong way to do it, sir. Um, wrong way. I, I definitely could have come up with five different courses of actions for you. But uh, let's just pray that we get everybody out and no deaths to Americans. And um, September 11th is coming around the corner. Keep your vigilance. This could be something that we need to keep an eye out for, guys. And I'm not kidding about that. Well, not to be depressed on that, but I'm going to leave on this note. You guys, until I see you next time. Adios.